Good morning. My name is Steve Berlin. I'm the uh, chair of the General Obligation Bond Public Safety Subcommittee. I'd like to welcome you all to the August 15, 2022 meeting of the General Obligation Bond uh, Public Safety Subcommittee. I hereby call this meeting to order. We have the interpreters here today to provide Spanish translation. Would you please introduce yourselves? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, my name is Elsie Duarte, and along with my colleague, Carmen Cota, we will be servicing as interpreters in today's meeting. I will now introduce myself to our Spanish-speaking audience. Buenos días, mi nombre es Elsie Duarte, y junto con mi colega, Carmen Cota, estaremos sirviéndoles hoy como intérpretes en la reunión de hoy. Al momento de hacer un comentario público, de favor les pedimos que hable despacio, con claridad y deténgase después de cada pocas oraciones para interpretarle de la manera más completa posible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. There will be a public comment period at the end of today's agenda, which will be up to 30 minutes in length. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits committee members to listen to the comments but prohibits members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Speakers will have up to two minutes to comment. However, prior to the start of the public comment period, I may specify a briefer duration based on the volume of speakers. If you are attending in person and would like to speak, you will need to sign up to speak at the kiosk, the kiosk back there located at the entrance to the council chambers before the call to public item begins. For virtual participants, registration to speak must be submitted two hours prior to the start of each meeting. Speakers will call in order, call in, be called in the order received, beginning with the virtual participants. I'd like to start with a few uh, remarks and uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Steve Berline. I'm a, actually a native of the city of Phoenix, and um, I am honored and uh, to be sitting here, be uh, given the trust and, and confidence of our mayor and council to chair this important uh, committee as, as we move forward and uh, make improvements with the city of Phoenix uh, across the board. Uh, I'm a retired Phoenix firefighter. I retired in June, and um, I also sit on the Board of Adjustments in the city of Phoenix. So again, I'm, I'm honored to volunteer my time and give back to the city in this important project. Um, as I, I go down the agenda, I want to thank the staff for all the work. Our staff, quite honestly, in the city of Phoenix have been working on these projects for years. And uh, they work really around the clock and they set us up for success. So I just want to recognize and thank all the staff who has been participating. Uh, City Council has directed the General Obligation Bond Committee to recommend a $500 million bond program to the City Council. Executive Committee has tasked this subcommittee with identifying the urgent needs related to public safety. Staff have provided a starting point through a capital needs study. The subcommittee will also be hearing from members of the community who may have different priorities, as well as hearing the ideas of this subcommittee's members. To manage information, staff will only provide a report on a new project concept at the direction of this subcommittee. Overall, the prioritized needs identified by staff exceed the $500 million bond program total. So through this process, the subcommittee will need to avoid growing the total program that is ultimately recommended to the executive committee. At, at this point, I, I would like to um, give the opportunities of these uh, committee members. I, I, I look at this list of name and, names and it's a who's who of leadership in the city of Phoenix and it's an honor to, to uh, even sit on a committee with, with these individuals. And um, if I could, I, I, I'm just gonna go down the list of that I've been given and give each member an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves. And I'll start with the good man on my left, Rick DeGraw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Rick DeGraw. I'm a newcomer to Phoenix. I've only been here 50 years. Um, I've been around the city for a long time. I've served on numerous committees and 
uh, other areas. I chaired the uh, previous bond committee on public safety, and I'm very familiar with the process. I'm glad the city is doing this. I believe the city needs to commit uh, even larger amounts um, uh, to public safety, and I believe public safety is one of the primary reasons that the city exists. Uh, I'm supportive of the police department. I believe their needs are uh, excessive and, need, and, and very important, and I'm supportive of the fire department. I believe that the response of uh, the first responders is the thing that most citizens wind up coming in contact with, and they do that when they're in the worst conditions and sometimes the best conditions. Uh, and I hope to be able to add to this subcommittee. I am also retired have been for the last nine years, and I'm willing to serve on the committee and provide my expertise where I can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board Member DeGraw. Next, uh, Board Member Ann Ender. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ann Ender, and I am the president of Operation Blue Ribbon. Um, our whole goal is basically to engage the communities with our law enforcement, specifically the police department, and it's an honor to be here. This is the first time I've been able to um, be on a committee like this, so excuse me. Um, I'm really grateful, and I'm a native Phoenician, so this city means a great deal to me, and I hope to be able to make good decisions for uh, um, the future of our public safety. Thank you, Board Member Ender. Next, I have uh, Derek Hall, but I've been advised Derek Hall is not in attendance today. Um, Greg Jackson, member Greg Jackson. Good morning. My name is Greg Jackson. Uh, I've been a City of Phoenix resident for about 25 years. Uh, it's been a great place to live. Um, I currently uh, work for TSMC Arizona. I'm uh, Director of Facilities in the new Wafer Fab we're building to the north. Obviously, public safety is a big deal for us and a big deal for the city. Uh, so I um, uh, feel privileged to be a part of this committee to uh, make sure the, the right facilities and services are being put in place across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Member Knight. Next, we have, uh, Member Jackson, I'm sorry. Uh, next, we have Board Member Gail Knight. And Gail, if you can introduce yourself, and um, we, we've we been briefed on, on the uh, paperwork that still needs to be signed, so, but uh, it would be okay for you to introduce yourself. Thank you. I serve on several boards and commissions with the city of Phoenix, have been in Phoenix for 31 years, um, came here via my husband that was a previous employee uh, now is deceased of uh, the city of Phoenix and happy to be here. Always focus on public safety in the community. Thank you, Member Knight. Next, we have Daniel Valenzuela. Daniel, are you on? Okay, he's not on. Um, next, we have Board Member Alton Washington. I believe you're muted. Can you hear me now? Uh, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Alton Washington. I'm a native Arizona and uh, retired city of Phoenix employee. I am pleased to be serving on this committee. I believe strongly in police and fire and the submittals that they have before us. Uh, they have done a tremendous job. And we really appreciate, and, and I appreciate the vision and, and the support of the mayor and council as well, and looking forward to serving this committee. Thank you for your service, Mr. Thank Washington. You. Next, we have board member Thelda Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm very honored to serve on this committee. Public safety has always been a priority. I believe that's what makes Phoenix great, is our great fire and police officers. And I know they have some really desperate needs uh, to upgrade their facilities. So I'm very honored to work on this and I look forward to our conversations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Member Williams. Uh, with that, um, our next agenda item is the appointment of the vice chair of the subcommittee. The executive Mr. committee has directed all subcommittees to appoint one of their members as the vice chair. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up to any board members if you want want to Mr. comment. Mr. Chairman. If, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to nominate Ann Ender as vice chair of this subcommittee. Okay, we have a motion from board member DeGraw. Second. Second. And we have a second from board member Williams. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Mr. Chair, are we only taking one nomination? I'm, I'm gonna have to turn to staff. Uh, this is member Knight who has a question. You have a motion on the table, so what you should do is continue through with that motion and vote on it, and then if someone wanted to make a substitute motion or, or something like that, that could possibly happen. But right now you have a motion on, and a second on the table. Okay, my, my question on, uh, on Member Knight with the paperwork that still needs to be completed, um, is Member Knight able to um, comment or, or vote? on this motion. Mr. Chairman, since she has not completed her oath of office, she should refrain from participating or voting in the meeting. Member Knight, with all due respect, did, did you hear that? Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, no other comments. I'll, I'll ask for a vote uh, in favor of Member Ender as vice chair. I vote aye. All in favor, aye. 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 Do we need to do to a roll call? Or are we okay? Uh, any nays? That being said, unanimous. Thank you, Member Ender, for stepping up. Thank you. It's an honor to do it. All right. So our next agenda item uh, is a staff presentation on the capital needs study. There will also be an opportunity for subcommittee members to discuss any projects they believe are critical that are not on the capital needs study. I will turn the meeting over to staff for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee. I'm Lori Bays, Assistant City Manager, and I'd like to start by introducing our presenters for this item. From the Police Department, Assistant Chief Michael Kurtenbach. From the Fire Department, Executive Assistant Chief Scott Walker. And I would also like to note that Police Chief Jerry Williams and Fire Chief Mike Duran should be present in the chambers today as well. For today's presentation, and if staff could pull up the PowerPoint, uh, Chief Kurtenbach and Walker will be providing an overview of each department and relevant public safety programs, as well as a description of the prioritized capital needs for each department. At the end of the presentation, we will also briefly outline additional future public needs, for, I'm sorry, future public safety needs for the police and fire departments. Throughout this subcommittee process, staff is happy to provide additional information beyond what is presented here today at the subcommittee's request. We would also be glad to show any subcommittee members that are interested the existing facilities in person. With that, I will turn the presentation over to Assistant Chief Kurtenbach. If I can get this clicker to work. Should be having some technical difficulties with our clicker. There we go. Chief Kurtenbach. Thank you, Lori. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. As Lori said, my name is Mike Kurtenbach, Assistant Chief of the Phoenix Police Department. I'll go over the agenda briefly with you. As you can see, uh, between Chief Walker and I, we're going to give you an update on our public safety needs as we know them today. So I'm going to start with an overview of the police department, go over our police department prioritized projects, then I'll turn it over to Chief Walker, who will go over the fire department and the fire department projects as well. Then we'll talk about future capital needs, uh, and we'll give you a summary uh, at the end. Of course, you're free to ask any questions along the way. Beginning with the police department, we have a total of 17 Phoenix Police Department facilities that we occupy. We lease five additional facilities, and we share eight other facilities with other city departments. It's quite an operation, as I'm sure you can appreciate. 
Total staff, approximately 3,600, with 1,000 of those being our non-sworn staff without whom we could not perform our critical function. And what we'll be going over today, and me in particular, are four prioritized projects for consideration. The prioritized projects total a little over $75 million over a five-year period. So our approach to identifying these projects, they're identified using the facility condition index. It's a rating showing a comparison between the cost of repairing a facility uh, versus the cost of rebuilding that said facility. So the higher the FCI, the lower the condition of the facility, a rating of fair to good is considered in the range of 10 to 15 percent. This was the barometer that we used to determine which projects to move forward with. So as you can see, using this guideline, uh, and what I'm going to go over in greater detail, are needs for Cactus Park and Northern Command Center, the Maryville Precinct, our police driver training. So much of our work is done in our patrol cars, which is in effect our office and then our property management warehouse renovation. So first I'm going to talk about Cactus Park and Northern Command. So Northern Command, for those of you that haven't been there, is in the area of 4th Street and Union Hills Road. Cactus Park is on the northwest corner of 39th Avenue and Cactus. Cactus Park was built around 1981-1982. Uh, I like to say it's a building that has character, because it certainly does. The facility is a little over 13,000 square feet. It has a facility where vehicles can be repaired on the property. It also has a 960-foot trailer that's just uh, to the rear of the main building. It has additional storage buildings and sheds, a fueling station, and the main building houses holding cells, and we have a shooting range there. Uh, both facilities would have millions of dollars in maintenance costs that ha have millions of dollars in maintenance costs that have been deferred to date. So the blue is the boundary of what we refer to as the Cactus Park Precinct. You can see the south southern boundary is down on Indian School, and you see how far north it goes, and you see where the current Cactus Park Precinct is. And then just outside of the precinct boundaries is where Northern Command is, just to the east on Union Hills. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Assistant Chief Kurtenbach. So that takes in District 1, 5, and 4, correct? I think part of 4 is in there. I believe that is correct. I, I should have looked at the map before I came in. I was just, I was just curious. I'm trying to keep track of that. Thank you. Uh, the adage that pictures are worth a thousand words, so I want to provide just some pictures so you can see the condition of the facility uh, between, as you see here, Cactus Park Precinct and Northern Command. Significant roof leakage, water damage inside the building. Both facilities are in a general state of disrepair. And just to kind of quantify the condition of the facilities, you'll see maintenance data over the last five years almost 300 total requests with just under 200 actual repairs done to these facilities. So exactly where this joint use facility would go is, remains to be determined, but we believe that would be in District 1. The scope would be to relocate the Cactus Park and Northern Command together to acquire approximately 10 acres in a suitable location. You noted in the map where Cactus Park Precinct is now, where it is now with the growth of the city is rather far south considering their area of responsibility. That affects important things such as response times when you respond from that building. You brief out of that building and you secure out of that building on 39th Avenue and Cactus. The idea would be to construct a precinct with a community room, much like we've seen in Black Mountain, we've seen in the Maryville Estrella Mountain Precinct. Uh, uh, and we've seen in Mountain View, much more inviting facility than this building and some of our older facilities. We would also have Traffic Bureau, which would be co-located in that facility. That would be good use of space, and we would add enough space to accommodate the staff that are needed to support the function. The total project cost is estimated in today's dollars to be 
for why it went away. There it is. Uh, just under $50 million, all of that would come from uh, the GEO bond funding. And considering that we're already operating two facilities, there, we don't anticipate any additional operating costs for the joint use building. The community benefit, a new modern improved police operations. I believe that would enhance efficiency for our officers that work out of that building and our other staff. We'd have the community room to have greater engagement, greater transparency with those that we serve. Precinct itself will be more inviting uh, for our officers and for the community, and it'll ensure con continuity of operations. Uh, significant issues keeping those buildings afloat today with the condition that they're in. Next, to talk about a building that I know very well. I spent a number of years out there in the Maryville Precinct. Located at 6180 West in Canto, and uh, Council Member uh, Ender, uh, you see this covers four council districts, four, five, seven, and eight. Constructed around 8990, I believe it concluded in 1990. No capital remodels or replacements since. The facility is just under 13,000 square feet. It has holding cells, it has a separate building that has an indoor shooting range. Vehicle repair and fueling uh, is available at that site as well. In 2012, there was update to access the uh, control system, and in 2015, hot water storage was rebuilt in the building. And I was joking with uh, Chief Walker here at this time of year. I remember being out there. It wasn't unusual for those of us that worked in that building to get buckets, to get garbage cans, whatever we could, just to contain the water that would come through the ceiling. There are over $1 million in deferred maintenance costs for that building at 6180 Weston Canto. You can see that the building is located in the Maryville Australia Mountain Precinct, which is a rather large precinct. It goes all the way Camelback up on the north to uh, southern, the city limits to the south. And uh, there's where it is, located just north of the I-10. Once again, you'll see general state of disrepair, standing water on the roof. I just spoke of that. Uh, paint, other things uh, inside the building. It's, uh, it's a bit of an eyesore if you're inside that facility, much like Cactus Park or Northern Command. Not very functional for the officers and the other staff that work out of the facility either. Proposed renovations include renovating and updating the precinct. Total cost of the project is just under $3 million, 2.98, as you can see there, and all of it would come from GEO bond funding because there's already an operational building. There's no additional operating costs that are anticipated with that facility. Community benefit, it is located in the, what is known as the 82 squad area. It is the busiest, most active squad area in the city of Phoenix, right on the border of the 81 squad area, which is the number two area, so you want to keep officers close to their areas of responsibility. That's why you want to have that building that is functional. So we'll extend the life of that building and the critical sy systems. The idea of make it more inviting to the officers and to the community. Also ensure continuity of service and our service delivery and to modernize police operations for our officers, for our staff, and for the community who we are entrusted to serve. Next, I want to talk about our police driving track. I alluded to it earlier. So much of our work is done inside of a patrol car, and there's a lot of liability that comes with having your office be a patrol car. Our driver training track is located out of 8645 West Broadway in Council District 7. If you hadn't had an opportunity to see it, as Ms. Bayes said earlier, I think there'll be an opportunity to see these facilities. Uh, to say it is not a modern facility would be an understatement. It certainly is not. And you can see from the pictures here that the track itself needs significant repair. See where it is tucked in there, just about 87th Avenue and Broadway Road. That picture in the upper uh, right-hand corner gives you an idea of uh, the track itself. So what we're requesting, the scope is to construct an additional driver training track and to repair the existing track to new condition. 
the cost overview is estimated to be just under $14 million. All of that would come from general obligation bond funding, and there are no additional operating costs anticipated for this facility. So critical to provide quality driver training for our employees. This would do just that, better prepare our officers for what they do every day and reduce the risk of damage and injury from vehicle-related conditions and the liability associated therein. Next, I want to talk about our property management warehouse located at 100 East Elwood in Council District 7. Originally constructed in 1992, it contains numerous mission critical functions, principally evidence storage and retrieval. It houses all the property that our officers need to do their job every day as well. The warehouse was designed at that time to store 1.2 million items. Currently, there are over 1.8 million items that are inside that building. To date, the facility has $6.8 million in deferred maintenance costs. Located in the South Mountain Precinct, you can see there at 100 East Elwood, just south of the river bottom. Here are some pictures, and again, I think pictures tell the story when you're uh, 600,000 items above what the building was constructed for. You see not just on the shelves, the shelves are full, and now we have items that are on the floor. Uh, pretty much every corner of that building, there is something that is, uh, is housed in a place that initially wasn't designed to be. Additionally, we have vehicle storage lots that are there on Elwood in our overflow lot at 22nd Avenue. Uh, you can see we are full in both locations as well. We are so full, in fact, that we are using other precinct facilities such as the uh, Maryville Estrella Mountain Precinct, which has a rather large lot there, the Estrella facility on 99th Avenue, uh, and in South Mountain Precinct as well to handle the overflow from all of the vehicles that we have impounded. With regard to the scope, it is to renovate that property management warehouse to secure the property for vehicle, to secure a property for vehicle evidence currently stored at a different location, to construct an admin building for the vehicle lot, to update and improve our aging evidence preservation and storage equipment, and to optimize space utilization and provide a true visitor lobby. The cost is projected to be a little over $9 million, all of which would come from bond funding with no additional operating costs. Community benefit, preservation and protection of crime scene evidence consistent with industry standards, that's critically important for our job, and to reduce service disruptions and avoid the cost of replacement in the future. Next, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Chief Walker, who will talk about the fire department. Thank you, Chief. Excuse me. Excuse me, Chief. Uh, may I ask a question sure. at this point? Uh, and that's about $81 million, I believe, of the bond total. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief Curtin Bach. Good morning, Chairman Berline, members of the committee. I'm Executive Assistant Fire Chief Scott Walker, and I'll be providing the Fire Department's portion of the presentation for you today. I want to start by providing just a brief summary of the services that the fire department provides to our community. The Phoenix Fire Department is what is known as what is an all-hazards fire department. What this means is we provide 24-hour emergency response services that include fire response, including a regional fire dispatch system that serves over 25 different jurisdictions here in our region, emergency medical services, technical rescue services like confined space, mountain rescues, and hazardous material response, and a patient transportation service. Additionally, we provide for fire prevention and community education services to the residents of Phoenix. We do all this with approximately 1,706 sworn full-time FTE positions and approximately 350 non-sworn staff. We serve the community through 58 fire stations that are strategically located throughout the city's 520 square miles. And we have four additional facilities that include our administration, our training, and our support services. I want to provide a few data points to demonstrate the growing demand for services at the fire department. So from 2009 to 2019, demand for services for, of the fire department has increased at a rate of 46%, while during that same time frame, our capacity only increased by less than 
So that's new fire stations, new fire products, new firefighters. So you can see we've had a diverging trend lines, and those continue to uh, increase at an exp exponential rate. Since 2021, the rate of increase has escalated from an annual average of 4 to 6 percent to an annual average of 7 to 10 percent over the last two years. So you can see those trend lines are going to rapidly continue to diverge. For 2022, we are estimating that we will respond to over 245,000 calls for service by the fire department. Next, I want to provide just a little bit of information about our community assistance program. That's because some of our projects will provide support for the CAP, or what we call the CAP program. So our CAP program has existed for several years in the fire service, but by actions of the Marin Council last fiscal year, we've significantly expanded this program. This program is key at really serving the community and addressing the needs of the community that often fall in the gap between the traditional fire and police services. This program consists of trained professionals that provide 24-hour on-scene crisis intervention that is focused on meeting the needs of the community members involved in traumatic situations, following up on frequent contacts to provide individualized care solutions, connecting individuals in need with community resources for ongoing support, and providing crisis and supportive services as needed to members as part of a wellness program. These services are provided through behavioral health specialists, and peer support specialists. We're very excited about the expansion of this program and what it's going to mean for our community. So next, the fire department has conducted a very comprehensive process to identify our highest party needs and for our four projects that we're bringing forward to the committee today. That process included a, using, utilizing an objective and data-driven analysis process utilizing multiple factors. We are fortunate in the fire service that we have clear measure standards that we can measure ourselves against and know how we are performing. Those standards include the National Fire Protection Association. For instance, they dictate that the first arriving fire engine should arrive on scene of a fire incident within five minutes and 20 seconds of dispatch. On an EMS scene, the first arriving ALS unit should arrive within five minutes of dispatch. We have the Arizona Department of Health Services. They regulate our ambulance service. They dictate that on our critical incidents, we need to have an ambulance on scene within 10 minutes, 90% of the time. And then we have the American Heart Association. They dictate that a four-person first responder unit should, resuscitation team should arrive on scene to provide care for a cardiac event, event a respiratory arrest, a drowning type event. And we know definitively that four to six minutes is the time frame that we need to arrive to, in order to provide the care uh, that's appropriate for that patient. We also know that after four to six minutes, the mortality rate does increase for a patient um, as, and as that increases as the time goes by. Additionally, we've compared the current system capacity compared to the needs. I've mentioned the diverging trend lines of 46% compared to 10%. We also look at our current response times. I've given you the standard of five minutes. Currently, the Phoenix Fire Department response time to EMS incidents on the 90 percentile scale is at 8 minutes and 55 seconds. So we are outside of the standard we are, we are strive for every day. Based on the projected increase in call volume, increasing response times, increasing growth across the city, we are projecting that by 2026, we could see response times to EMS incidents at 11 minutes and 37 seconds. We also look at projected growth trends. We work with and meet with the Planning and Development Department regularly on a quarterly basis to understand where the city is growing and going. We know the city is growing north, it's growing south, it's growing west, and it's growing up in the downtown area. So we want to try to have an idea where our highest party needs are, and all this information then allowed us to build and create a 20-year facilities projection for fire stations in administrative space. That is the information that we utilize to produce the high-priority projects that we're bringing forth to the committee today. We are submitting four prioritized projects for consideration, and these projects will total, uh, have a total value of over $83 million over the five-year period. So next, I want to go into detail on the four projects that we're bringing forward to you. So our highest priority project that we're bringing forward is a replacement of fire station number seven, which will include facility for the CAP program. Fire station number seven is located at 4th Street and Hatcher in District 3. Simply put, station seven simply does not have the capacity to, and is unable to support the demand for services for that area. Station seven was built in 1966, and it was designed for a different era, a much less diverse workforce, we did not have female firefighters in the workforce at that time. That station is 4,636 total square feet, including apparatus space. The station houses the busiest engine company in the system, in the regional system. That engine company is projected to run to 5,894 calls for service this calendar year. And we also know and can prove through data 
that 28% of the calls for service in this primary first due of this station are being managed by secondary responses, meaning the stations in the neighboring area are having to respond into this area to provide service because Station 7 is already on an incident. This has a ripple effect throughout the system on response times and service delivery. So for replacement of fire station number seven in the CAP location, our recommendation and we're bringing forth is to construct a new 18,000 square foot five bay fire station. The 18,000 square foot does include the apparatus bays and repurposing the existing station for the community assistance program. This project is projected to cost $21,370,986,000 and would be entirely funded by the GEO bond program. We would have ongoing operational costs, increase in costs of $3,727,000 for this project. So the impacts and the benefits to the community for this project would be increased service delivery capacity to the community, improved response times, would allow for an additional engine and rescue company to be assigned to the station, and would provide a strategic location for the community assistance program vehicle and unit to be dispatched from. So our second highest priority project we're bringing forth is replacement of fire station number 13 and the CAP location. Station 13 is located at 47th Place and Thomas Road, just south, and it's located in District 6. And much like Station 7, simply put, the station capacity is unable to support the demand for service in this area. As a side note, this was the first station I ever worked in 29 years ago, and it was small and outdated at that time. This station was built in 1958. It is our oldest fire station in the system, and it too was built for a different era, I can assure you. It is only 3,340 square feet total, and that includes the apparatus base. You can see in the picture, and that is not Photoshop, the engine barely fits into the apparatus base. The station also houses one of the top 10 busiest engine companies in the system, projected to run 4,882 calls for service this calendar year. And finally, again, data will prove and show that 24% of the calls for service in this first due are being managed by other companies in the neighboring stations. So for the replacement of fire station number 13 in the CAP location, our projected scope would be to construct a new 18,000 square foot five bay fire station, again, including apparatus bays, and to repurpose the existing station for the community assistance program. This project is projected to cost $21,715,424,000 and would be entirely funded by the GEO bond program. We would have an ongoing operational cost for this project as well at $3,727,000. So the impact and the benefits of the community, again, increased service delivery capacity to the community, improve response times, allow for an additional engine rescue company in the station, and provide a strategic location for the community assistance program to be dispatched from. So our third project we're bringing forth is replacement of fire station number 15 and CAP location. And I apologize if these seem redundant, but this is just the reality of where we are today. So station 15 is located at 43rd Avenue Camelback in District 5. This is in the Maryville area. This is an extremely busy area for the fire department. The station too is simply does not have the capacity to, and is unable to support the demand for service to this neighborhood. The station was built in 1979 and while newer, still really designed for a different era than we see today. This station is a little bigger at 4,597 square feet than station 13, but still not big enough for the demand for the service in this neighborhood. This houses one of the top 10 busy engine companies as well, projected to run 5,086 calls for service this calendar year. And again, we know the data can demonstrate that 26% of the calls for service in this primary first due are being managed by other companies. And as I said, the Maryville area is very busy, so this has a significant ripple impact of service delivery throughout the entire Maryville area. So for this project, for the replacement of Fire Station 15 and the CAP location, the scope again we're uh, bringing forth is to construct a new 18,000 square foot five bay fire station, including apparatus bays, and repurposing the existing station for the community assistance program. This project is projected to cost $21,370,986,000 and would be totally funded by the GEO bond program and again, we would have ongoing operational costs of $3,727,000 for this project. The benefits of this project and impacts to that community would be increased service delivery capacity of the community, improved response times, allowing for an additional engine and rescue company in the station, and again, providing a strategic location for the community assistance program to be dispatched from. So our fourth project that we're bringing forth is a new fire station number 51. There is no existing location or no existing fire station in the location we're recommending. This is located in the northwest part of Phoenix. Again, we all know this is a very growing part of the city. And so because of that, we are bringing this project forward. This station would be located at the Interstate 303 and 51st Avenue in that area. And this would be in District 1. 
And as I said, this is a grow very growing part of Phoenix, and part of that growth, and much of that growth is being driven by the development growth occurring in Northwest Phoenix, but also the TSMC silicone chip, chip wafer plant being built. This is the second largest chip, uh, chip wafer chip plant being built in the world. This is bringing significant industry, not just for this facility that spans almost two sections of land, over 1,200 acres, but also significant industry coming to the north area of, northern area of Phoenix to support the chip plant. We also know that this facility and other materials be in the northern Phoenix area will have hazardous type materials that could be transported or stored in facilities. We also know that this is a, in the area of a major commerce transport corridor. The I-17 and the I-303 is major commerce moves across the United States through these routes. In fact, the 303 is the bypass for commerce can bypass the downtown Phoenix area and move to the western part of the country. So there's a significant need in the northwest part of Phoenix for a new station. So for new fire station number 51, our scope would be to construct a new 20,000 square foot five bay fire station. This again includes the apparatus bays. This project would be projected to cost $24,545,514. There is additional uh, funding that could be available in the form of impact fees and other sources we are uh, examining. So our projecting, uh, projecting impact of the GEO bond program would be $18,545,515. We would have ongoing operational costs of $7,529,000 for this station because this is a net new station to the system. So the impacts and the community benefit of this project would be increased service delivery capacity to the community in the northwest part of Phoenix, certainly improved response times in the northwest part of Phoenix. This station would allow for an engine, a new engine, a new ladder, a new ambulance or rescue, hazmat support, and a battalion chief company. This would be what we call a hub type station in the system. This also would provide for increased response time or in increased ability to manage hazardous material incidents, not just in this immediate area, but also for the region as well. So with that, that concludes my portion of the presentation. I will now turn it back over to Assistant City Manager Bays for the summary. Thank you, Chief Walker. And uh, before I go to the next slide, I just wanted to make one point of clarification to uh, Subcommittee Member DeGraw's question. The total projected cost for the police department prioritized needs is $75.3 million. So I just wanted to make sure we had that accurate for you. So in, in summary, um, those are our prioritized needs. Um, as they sit today, there are also some additional public safety future capital needs that we want to make sure that the subcommittee is aware of. Um, again, these are not the highest priority needs as we see them, um, but we do want to make the subcommittee aware of, of a fuller picture of what the needs are. These include a new fire station 70 and CAP facility at 39th Avenue and Cactus, replacing fire station 20 at 7th Avenue and Glendale, a new fire station 74 at 19th Avenue and Chandler Boulevard, a new fire station 77 at 35th Avenue in Campbell, renovating the police academy, phase two of the police driver training track, and additional police precinct renovations in several locations. And I, I won't go through all of these again, but these are the, the um, projects that were just discussed by Chief Walker and Chief Kurtenbach, um, and we do have this slide available for your reference as you deliberate today and in future meetings if you'd like to use it. I also wanted to remind the subcommittee uh, that we do have three additional subcommittee meetings scheduled. Our goal is for the subcommittee to complete development of its recommendations to the executive committee by that final meeting. Thank you so much, and we would be happy to answer any questions that the subcommittee has. Thank you, Ms. Bay. Thank you, Chief Kirkbach and Chief Walker for that, those outstanding presentations. At this time, I'd like to open up the meeting to subcommittee, subcommittee members for any comment. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm sorry, did you call on me? Oh, I'm sorry. Member DeGraw. Yes, okay. Um, as pointed out, over the past decade, response times for Phoenix Fire have become longer and longer. And as the chief uh, kindly said, we all know that increased response time from public safety personnel lead to more deaths among seniors and children in cases of heart attacks, strokes, and drownings. Longer response times also take a toll on the mental health of our first responders and their families. It takes a physical toll because fewer stations and longer runs are harder on the body and on the mind. Therefore, I'm asking the subcommittee and staff to consider addressing this problem immediately and in the near future by adding at least three additional fire stations, 
um, and by increasing the funding for the police uh, driver training academy. I would specifically request that the renovation of Station 20 at 7th Avenue in Glendale, also a very old station, um, a new fire station uh, 70 at 39th Avenue in Cactus, and a new fire station 74 at 19th Avenue in Chandler be added to this bond request. This would add approximately $46 million to the current request. I make this request to not only protect the 300,000 citizens who have moved to Phoenix in the past decade, but to protect the lives, safety, health, and mental health of our first responders and their families. And I would make that as a motion. Member DeGraw, I would ask for you to hold off at the motion um, and we, we can give it to staff to report on the next meeting and if we need to. I would be glad action. to do so. Thank you. Chairman, hey. Chairman um, Verline, yes, I have a, a couple of questions and comments. So the reason I was asking about where the um, precincts and the fire departments are in terms of the districts is that um, we look at that closely, the coverage of the area. I mean, that, that tells us the coverage of the area. And what's important is in terms of police department is, and the fire department, I should say, as it relates to crime. So I would imagine um, that, for example, the 27th Avenue corridor plan is going to be critical to Cactus Park, so therefore these renovations and upgrades need to very much be considered. Um, I also think in terms of, for example, Maryvale, Australia, I recently reviewed the 2022 homicide rates by precinct, and here to date, they have the highest homicide rates. And of course, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But so um, one of the things I was hoping maybe we could get would start looking at what the calls for service are for the capital needs that are in question for fire as well as, as for police department. And I do think that these um, things that I've mentioned, um, Chief Walker, Assistant Chief Walker, are very much aligned also with the fire department because obviously the crime has to be affecting um, the number of calls and, and the uh, call time. So that would be really helpful, I think, to all of us to have that information. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I, this is Thelma. Member Williams, thank you. Uh, do, if, I have two questions. One, is there a preset estimate of how much this committee will be able to fund in the bond program? That's the first question. And secondly, uh, as part of the report back, based on the previous speaker's questions, could you also include the response that comes from other cities as backup to our department? Because I know Glendale answers a lot of Phoenix requests. So I would appreciate that information. Thank you. Thank you, Member Williams. Any other comments from board members? Any other comments? Um, with that, just, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to piggyback on, Mr. Chairman. Member Washington, thank you. Uh, just, just to piggyback on, on uh, Thelma's question, uh, it would be helpful for the committee to, to uh, hear more about how the automatic aid program actually works with, with other cities. Uh, that'll put, it, put everything in the proper context of how we support them and vice versa, how they support us. Thank you, Member Washington. Any other members? With that, I have a couple comments and, and questions. First of all, I'd like to recognize our Police Chief Williams and the outstanding leadership she provides to the Phoenix Police Department and our Fire Chief Duran for the outstanding leadership uh, he provides to the Phoenix Fire Department and the entire city of Phoenix. Um, there are men and women in public safety that are protecting us 24 hours a day and they do a phenomenal job with the presentations we just saw there are many many needs 
way more needs than there is going to be revenue. And we have to uh, consider, if you heard any testimony from the mayor and council, they would love to um, make all these projects happen now, and the city manager and, and staff. But we have to be realistic with what's available um, and keep that in mind. But that shouldn't uh, hold back from making any requests. So um, it's just going to take a lot of work from all the good people who are involved right now. Um, Chief Walker, you had talked about response times, and um, there's there's standards and requirements, and there was one a, a there was a little a five minute, just over five minute response time, and then AZDHS it was ten minutes. Can you comment on what the difference is and the requirement versus the recommendation in response times? Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Berline, for the question. So specifically. The response time set for the National Fire Protection Association for fire and emergency response is five minutes and 20 seconds for the first arriving engine to a fire incident, five minutes for the first arriving uh, advanced life support unit to an EMS incident. Because ambulance transportation isn't really something that's regulated or uh, measured in, by the National Fire Protection Association, they don't set a standard when an ambulance should arrive. So because our ambulance service is regulated by the Arizona Department of Health Services, they dictate really the standard that we have to meet. That is a hard standard. That is something that when we are outside that standard, they do question our ability to continue to deliver our service, and there can be consequences for that for us. So the standard is on the ambulance transport is when an, when an ambulance is dispatched, it needs to arrive within 10 minutes, 90 percent of the time, or using the 90 percentile scale, um, for a critical incident or a code three type response by an ambulance. That's the standard we hold ourselves accountable to, and we're held accountable to as part of our certificate of necessity. Thank you. And would we get um, a report if it, we take a package to the community, the citizens pass it. Um, we, we are seeing these numbers and the needs in the field for police officers and firefighters and paramedics. Uh, would it be possible to um, get some kind of a report to show what the impact if these facilities are fully staffed, how that will benefit the citizens of Phoenix? That would be my request. Chairman I would you like me to respond or just uh, would you, is that a request from us? I'll, I'll leave that to staff, and I believe staff will be um, passing the request on to you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we'd be happy to bring back further information for all of the items that the various subcommittee members have requested today for the, the following meeting, if that is agreeable to you. That would be excellent. Thank you. Okay, at this time we are going to turn to public comment. We have uh, we have a total of eight speakers, seven are virtual and one in person. I will give each speaker two minutes. Uh, we will start with virtual participants. When your name is called, your audio device will be unmuted and you will you may begin your remarks. At the conclusion of the virtual speakers, we will invite in-person attendees, attendees to the podium to address the committee. And I'll now ask the city attorney uh, to go ahead and explain the rule of public comment in GEO bond committee meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the public may speak to comment on the general obligation bond program. The city code requires speakers to present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language, threats, or personal attacks on members of the public council members, committee members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will lose the opportunity to continue to speak. The committee and staff cannot discuss or comment on matters relating to pending claims or litigation. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll now ask staff to call the speakers. Good morning. Our first speaker will be Stacia Hurst, followed by Brian Rodriguez. Stacia, Hello, this is Stacia. Line? Can you hear me? Yes, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Public Safety Subcommittee members and staff. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to make some public comments. Uh, I have reached out to several trusted resources, and um, you guys probably already know this, but it's really hard to, to follow the money, especially with fire and police. It's the top two things that the city needs to allocate funds to. Um, when you review the last bond initiative, 
Uh, the Phoenix Police Department was awarded a hefty budget to renovate a newly acquired building for the Cactus Park precinct. And now 14 years later, this project is considered a critical need to completely reallocate or excuse me, relocate um, at the cost of an additional $49 million. And in the presentation from uh, Chief Kurtenbach today, it appears there is no maintenance or upkeep on these buildings. They're just using the buildings until they uh, until they're they're no longer functional and then asking to to relocate. And um, I do have more questions than comments at this time, but something to consider is why is everything in a general state of disrepair always? Is it too much to ask to take care of these buildings? Um, the police department and the city is present capital need. We need maintenance. Um, you have a fiscal responsibility to make sure that our fire departments and our police departments have their resources and they are maintained. Um, you know, we, we depend on these two for public safety um, and you need to spend the funds more responsibly. Please take care of these buildings. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Rodriguez, followed by Greg Morales. Brian, are you on the line? Okay, uh, uh, Brian is not with us. Greg Morales, are you on the line? Greg is not with us. Trevor, uh, our next speaker will be Trevor Halpern, followed by Ben Lindquist. Okay, Trevor uh, is not with us. Uh, ben Lindquist will be next, followed by Anna Hernandez. Ben, are you on the line? I am here. You may proceed. All right, um, my name is Ben Lindquist. Uh, I'm the uh, vice president of local 493 firefighters um, and also a firefighter uh, down in South Phoenix at station 22. Um, I'd like to uh, advocate for the same thing that board member DeGraw had mentioned about uh, adding uh, additional stations. I know there are five, uh, three of which he spoke about that are allocated to the future capital needs um, down the road. Uh, but for all the reasons that uh, Chief Walker had mentioned, I think it would be a good idea to try to get these uh, added to this current bond request. Um, I, I, I think it's important that to note that we do represent our members. And in this case, uh, our members got hired to try to be firefighters to help the community. And I can tell you they're, they're frustrated in their lack of ability to be able to help in a lot of different cases to try to make it, um, you know, understandable to the layperson what it means to have an outside fire station coming to help in a in someone else's first due. We're frequently driving by other fire stations on our way to calls right now because that station is out on another call. And when seconds and minutes matter in our response time for the outcome of somebody who called 911, that's a huge deal. Um, and this again is happening frequently. I, I, I can't say that this is any person's fault or anything like that. I can say as firefighters, when we're tasked with something or when we're asked to do something or more with less, we've simply said we got it for a long time and we have had it. But now I, I, I fear that we've we've gotten to a point where we just don't got it anymore. Uh, we're not being able to get to people in a time that we want to be able to do it, to be able to make a significant positive outcome in people's life when they call 911. And I think uh, it, it would be... Um, not fair or, or not uh, the right thing of me to do to not advocate for the members that that I represent um, to try to get them the resources they need to provide the care to that they want to be able to provide to the community in a timely manner. So um, I thank you guys for your time and hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Lindquist. Our, our next speaker will be Anna Hernandez. Should be followed by uh, in person uh, Heidi Richardson. Anna, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, so, I would like to speak today specifically on the request from Phoenix PD um, in these uh, capital needs. Um, as a city of Phoenix resident and a taxpayer, I um, oppose any increase. Um, in funding to Phoenix PD, uh, they were just allocated an increased budget of $850 million in addition to the $20 million for pay raises. I believe any maintenance needs, any building needs, 
um, any upkeep needs that are that they want that they would like to do should come from that budget. Um, it's nearing a billion dollars, and I just do not believe that taxpayers should continue to invest funding into Phoenix PD um, when we are not seeing that translate over to actual public safety for the residents of Phoenix. Um, if we want to really address that in this in this bond um, in this bond that's going to go to vote in November of 2023, we should allocate those funds to true public safety needs. That, in my opinion, would be uh, housing, would be uh, services for our unsheltered folks, um, addressing the climate needs that cause that you know cause some of the issues that we see you know um, along throughout the city. Um, also believe that we should put that into more parts and um, just services like that. Um, again, I just as a citizen and a taxpayer, I would not like, I would like to see that this is not included any, any bond moving forward because it does not address the true public safety. Also, any of these upgrades are not gonna be very welcoming to the com community. Like we're not gonna feel safer to go into a precinct just because it looks nice from the outside, um, because that still does not address the uh, behavior of Phoenix PD um, th that we know and that know that we know happens and that we see um, happen continuously. So thanks for the time. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. I'm sorry, our last virtual speaker will be Heidi Richardson, followed by in-person Timothy Gamage. Heidi, are you on the line? I am. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking as a concerned parent from District 6. Um, I'm here to reiterate what Mr. Ben Linquist just um, shared and voiced his opinion on the needs currently in our community. It's recently, recently been brought to my attention that despite the increase in our population, especially over the past few years, we haven't increased our number of first responders. I was actually shocked when I heard this because this is extremely disheartening to me. Um, as a mom of five children, heaven forbid, but if I ever had to call 911 for an emergency at my home, my hope and actually my expectation is that I will have a well-rested crew arriving to my emergency. And my expectation is also that they're gonna arrive in a very timely manner within five minutes. However, I've just learned that this actually isn't the case. Um, the reality right now is that our first responders are being overworked and they're unable to respond in a timely manner um, that they want to and that every citizen would want them to. Um, I know that there are other cities in our community similar in size to Phoenix that have a much higher ratio of firefighters per residence than Phoenix. So it's time for us to follow suit and increase our number of first responders. Um, let's let our heroes be the heroes they want to be and that our community deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Thanks. Uh, in the upper council chambers, we have Timothy Gamage. How's everybody doing? Uh, Tim Gamage, I am a 15 year Phoenix firefighter, uh, captain working in fire investigations now. Uh, today I'd like to speak to you just as a citizen. Uh, I grew up playing Little League at Starlight Park in Maryville, uh, Pop Warner at Hermosa Park in South Phoenix, and uh, I've lived in Phoenix my whole life, 38 years. I shouldn't have to leave my city to go get my family adequate fire and EMS coverage. When Chief Walker said that number nine minutes and said that it could possibly grow to 13 minutes in 2026, we should all be alarmed. This this chamber should be full as well as downstairs. Uh, we have to do something, probably even more than what we're doing with this bond to impact that number. Um, some people aren't gonna fill it until it happens in their house. Hopefully we do something here today in the and in the future to not allow, to cut right to it, people to die. Uh, thank you for your time. That's all I got to share. Thank you, Mr. Gamage. Okay, this con concludes our public comment period. I want to thank, say thank you to all the speakers today. 
And based on today's discussion, do any subcommittee members have requests for the next meeting agenda? Anybody? Okay, um, I would ask Ms. Bays if, if you could just review what you have for us. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chair. What uh, we have for review for the next meeting is a more detailed description of the proposed projects for Station 20, Station 70, and Station 74 uh, per board member DeGras' request. Um, also, information on calls for service, both police and fire, related to the capital needs in question. This will include a review of the automatic aid program and the partnership that we have with other cities to provide service. We will also be able to discuss uh, how increased capacity via bond requests will positively impact response times. Uh, and then there was also a request by Board Member Williams to discuss uh, the preset amount for the bond money for this particular subcommittee. I can address that right now, um, which is there is a total of $500 million um, that the executive committee has requested that the subcommittees contribute to. There is no preset amount for each subcommittee. There are eight subcommittees. If you were to divide that up equally, I believe that's about $62 million a piece, but there is no preconceived notion that it will be divided equally. The recommendations will go to the exec executive committee, which Chairman Berline is a part of, and that executive committee will determine the most appropriate way to divide up the resources of $500 million by the recommendations that the subcommittees provide. So I hope that's helpful to the subcommittee members. Thank you, Ms. Bays. With that, are there any other questions or requests from board members? No? All right. Again, I want to thank staff, all of you, for setting this project up and setting this committee up for success. I really do appreciate it. Our next meeting is scheduled for August 29th. Subcommittee, subcommittee members, please notify staff in advance if you have a conflict with this meeting date. And with that, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. So moved and second. All in favor, aye. aye. Thank you. Aye. of collaboration between business, education, and community partners. It's our support of entrepreneurial ecosystems. It's life-changing innovations. It's all this and so much more that I'm excited to share with you about our city. As you're about to see, Phoenix is the new land of opportunity. I invite you to join us. Welcome to Phoenix, Arizona. This desert is flourishing, probably more than you ever imagined. Fact is, Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the nation and for years has been attracting more people than anywhere else. At the same time, we've been attracting business and creating our own. Since 2019, bioscience and healthcare growth has added millions of square feet of biomedical space, billions in capital investments, and more than 8,000 new jobs. So what makes Phoenix so attractive to so many? It's a convergence of qualities that can be summed up in two words. Innovation and exhilaration. <laughs>